that have come to give before the TRC of Liberia is the truth and nothing but the truth. So help me God. Please be seated. Good morning, um, ladies and gentlemen. I want to, on behalf of the TRC, once again welcome you to the, four, um, the December 4th hearing of the TRC. And to the witness on the stand, I want to say on behalf of the TRC, we welcome you and we want to say thank you for responding to our call. Um, as you are aware, for the past few months or 12 months, we've been holding public hearings in the Republic of Liberia. Um, the TRC mandate is to investigate atrocities that were committed um, during the civil crisis that took place in this country. And during one of the hearings, um, we had witnesses or, or witness on day one and also in piano witnesses to come before the TRC um, to mention your name as to atrocities that you committed um, during the crisis. And so this is the reason why you were called here today to answer to these allegations um, so that we all know the truth and the air is clear as to whether um, you actually performed some of them or not. So on behalf of the TRC, we want to, to once again say welcome. Um, before we give you the stand to testify, I would like to um, introduce the commissioners to you so that you are aware of who you are talking to. And so I will start from my far right. We have uh, on my far right, Shika Fumakone. Next to him, Commissioner Per Bamboo. Next to her, did you see Commissioner Boo? Yes, I did. Okay. Next to her, Commissioner Umusila. Excuse me. Commis Commissioner Umusila. Okay. And then on my far left, we have Commissioner Jiro Komon. Speaking to you is Commissioner Dede Tolope the first year of the TRC. There was also a time um, when the first witness who mentioned your name uh, came back to the TRC to say uh, what he said was untrue. There were uh, testimonies that said that you supported that effort to come back to the TRC to say that that statement was untrue. So we want you to answer to all of these allegations and statements um, when you are doing your testimony. Before you start the actual testimony, could you please say something about yourself for the record so that we have more information on you and get to know you better. Thank you very much. <clears throat> I thank you very much. And I thank the entire TRC for giving me this opportunity to come and give my side of the story. I thought it was it's a wonderful thing and it also signify transparency. Uh, I'm also happy that I can be a part of the process as it relates to uh, bringing uh, lasting peace and reconciliation to all of us as Liberians. My name is uh, S. Michael Davis, known as Sunday God Dear Boy. I'm a librarian artist, uh, born 1972, July 20th. Uh, I would like to stop right there, right there for now. Um, I would also like to quickly ask before I proceed if we are observing a timeline here. 
that is how many minutes or hours do I have to speak so that I will know or if I just have to go on so that I can also know I think the first thing is that there were allegations made um, at the TRC about you which you are aware of because if I can remember um, the one that was done on day one of the TRC hearing was publicized and you came to us about that and then the one in Bikiana you were also present at those hearings so we want you to speak directly to allegations made against you and also your role in the aspect where and uh, that victim came to say that the story was untrue. All right, um, <clears throat> first of all, I would like to say to all of you and to everyone in this republic that there are two kinds of victim in the situation, uh, the war, or what was in our country. And one victim uh, is those who were civilians and they experienced much treatment by fighters, people who were raped, killed, and they can no longer live to tell the story, uh, people who whom were vandalized in the reservoir. And the other victim on the other side are people who found themselves on the other side of where the war, active war was going on, and they thought that where they were was to seek refuge and they were also forced uh, to be a part of the process if not being killed and the trauma also remains with them and walk around with it today those people should be considered as well as victims now to begin with to begin with I was here in Monrovia and the war was on and the Prince Johnson a troop behind behavior came to Monrovia and we lived in Logan Town at the time and the war had intensified and there was no food people were being killed as a result of rockets and stuff and then my mom and I with my two little sisters who decided to leave to go to the Grand Bassa, so we walked by way of Carwell, Cruiserville, all the way until we enter Habel, then we went to uh, Grand Bassa in a town called Dwastown. We were there for some time, and fighters were coming in and going out, beating people, taking away the properties and stuff, and I decided to leave and get on the main road and I found my way in Bikiana. And when I was in Bikiana, I met a friend and she and I got along. And she was a businesswoman and my livelihood was depending on her. We used to get oil and take it to, uh, there was something called the Puma T, the train that used to travel from Grand Basso to, to Yekepa. And then you take the oil to Guinea, sell it, buy clothes and other needed items, bring it over Canada and sell. Until, um, and that was in 92. Some part of 92, I was in number four, and the fighters took over Bikiana. And when they took over Bikiana, I found my way back to, to Bikiana to meet my girlfriend and she went to compound three and then I went back to collect the rest of our things because people were getting their things out. They had actually not occupied the city yet but the city was being deserted and people were just coming in, going out, taking away what belonged to them. And in the process I decided to go back to number four and take up the oil, the rest of the oil we had. While coming, we, we could not make our way by way of Bijou Town because there was heavy gunfire. And then we ran back. And then I joined a group of friends to go to RTI, thinking I could find my way to, to the compound. I couldn't. 
so I joined those friends and I went to um, Sino. When I got to Sino, about a week plus, I went to Maryland. And when I got to Maryland, I also had some further friends who were finding their way into um, La Côte d'Ivoire by way of Tabu. So I went to Tabu. And then I formed my way from Tabu to San Pedro, then to Abidjan, then to Danane. I stayed in Danane and I decided to, to find my way to, to Liberia, but as a business person, so um, whatever money I had, I went by way of Guinea and went to, to Zerukuri got some tobaccos and went to Liberia, especially in Banga. And I saw those things and went back to Danane. I was living at uh, La Garde de Mar, somewhere they call uh, Cartel Functionnel. And then I told my friend who he and I was together, Moses King, and I said, look, I have to go back to Liberia because I want to find my girlfriend. Where I saw Banga is very, very lively. So I came back. He and I actually went back to Banga. When we got there, I decided to go because I left her, she was in number three. And we went, we went, Moses King and I, he left in Banga and I walked, I took car and they stopped me somewhere, I wouldn't remember where. And then I went to uh, number three. While crossing from Bon County to enter number three, I saw her coming. It was kind of funny and I was so happy. So she said, oh, Thank God I, you back. I told you were never coming back anymore. Where are you going? She said, I'm going to Ganta. But let's go to Ganta, then when we come back. So I'm like, can I go in the village and meet your mother? She said, I'm not in the village. I'm a compound tree. So we went. Ganta, she sold whatever goods she had, and then we went on compound tree. But we got on compound tree. There's a lady called E.K. She called me and said, Michael? I said, yeah. She said, what are you doing here? I said, I've come to see Daba, my girlfriend. She said, you shouldn't have come here. This girl is in an affair with one of the, the guys here in the group. They are very, very bad. If you knew, you shouldn't have come here. So she wasn't around when she came. We went in and I started talking to her. She was like, oh no, nothing's happened. Everything is OK. In the middle of the night, some group of army bust the door, grabbed me, brought me out, had me tied up and beaten. She escaped and went and called Regino Balloon, which is which his name is General Gonda. He was in control of number three at that time. And Regino sent people to, to rescue me. And I want to use this opportunity to also be grateful to him. And then he called her and asked, they arrested those soldiers and had them in jail. And then he asked her and she explained, this is my boyfriend, we've been together for long, but he left because of the war. And now he's back and they are trying to take revenge because of their friends. So Regina said, look, uh, you guys will have to stop. Well, because of fear, they were always intimidating me. Regina said, you have to come here and be with me every day. So I went to Regino, which General Gunnar, every morning I have to go to him. So the fighters started seeing me around him. And at a certain point in time, I started getting, invo getting involved in their, in their discussion. And he started asking me to write communication, like passes and things, and I was doing it. I stayed there for like two, three months. And basically that's what I was doing. So she said, Michael, we have to go to the village and, make, and start making farm." So we left the compound and went to the village. We make farm and we had the, there was a group called the Never Die from somewhere called Dissot Town. They were, they were the ones who brushed the farm, we paid them. And then uh, when the rest was growing, a group of army went on the village. And they said I was under arrest and I needed to go to St. John. I did follow them. And they said I was an AWOL soldier. AWOL is a word used uh, in the military at the time, asking with all leave. 
So I said, how can I be an A1 soldier? I said, you are on a compound. You are a soldier. And then you come here, and you sit here making farm, and everybody else are on duty. So we have to send you on the front. So I appealed to them. The commander was Winston C. And Winston said, okay. What we do is, you have to go back, but you cannot tell us that you're not soldier because you should be with Gonda on the compound. And I said, you guys know why I was there. I needed somewhere to rest and I needed to be rescued. I didn't want anything to happen to me, especially when I came to Daba and the guy she was in on the fairway. So I went back and I was on the compound and D Daba used to go to uh, Ganta and buy pepper, I mean buy Maggie Cube and other things and bring it to the village and the system was battle system. You, you give what you have and they give you oil, they give you meat and then she took that or those and carry it for silk. So the house was surviving. So she asked me to go for her and I was on my way going for her and I arrived in one town and in the town I saw a group of armed men. They were led by one Moses Nasser who was a commander in Gipu Wo. Not knowing they were on their way to Vibor where I was living to go there for me. When I saw them, the statement was yes. God knows how to do things. We we're actually trying to get you from Vibor. But now that you've come this way, you make our job easier. I was grabbed, severely beaten. Unfortunately, you're not closer to me to see this mark right here on my hand and on the other side. I was tired and Completely made butt naked, just as my mother bore me. And I was taken back to Vibor. And the whole town was vandalized. Everybody there, they felt a part of the weight that those guys took in the village. And the reason for which they did it, they said, I was an AWOL soldier, enjoying, and while the rest of them were fighting, and some, some of them were on duty, and I just sat down there, I reached, and I didn't want to do anything. I was tied up and they, they had a kitchen, they put a lot up. So they took me into the kitchen, but then before carrying me up the kitchen, they had me loosened. And I was up the kitchen, my mother-in-law was crying. It was in the middle of the night. They cooked and they started to eat. So while they were eating, I asked my mother-in-law because there was no sign in the kitchen where they, they had me, but all the sign was where they had the food. So I asked, is there anyone in the kitchen or under the kitchen here? She said, no. I said, then you have to leave. So she left, and I jumped down and I escaped. When I escaped, I ran to the bush. It was very dark. And then, they, you know, they had a place called Guanya where you keep your things because the fighter was always coming and taking people's property. So they always had a place like a village in the village where people kept their things. I went, took, I went there because I knew they took one trouser. I wore it. And then I walked to St. John. It was very late. I stayed in one early town until day. When I got to St. John, I met Winston C. and I explained what happened. He sent some soldiers. They went to Gebuho. At the time, the soldier had already gone back to Gebuho, took away some of the things that he took from me and the town people. And then I went back to him. Before going back to him, we got into the town and the town people called a meeting and said, you know what, Marco? Your being here is causing us a lot of pain. So we are afraid that you have to leave. I didn't have anywhere to go. It was... It was so pathetic. And T was the only person I knew at the time. So I told her, I said, you know what? I cannot allow myself to leave because I don't have anywhere to go. So can you please tell your people that I stay here and they said the people have come to the conclusion that you leave because your presence is causing them a lot of embarrassment. Then we went to Winston C. She and I agreed to go to Winston C. And when we got to Winston C, we talked to Winston and I was like, Winston, I cannot allow myself to be treated the way I was treated at first. Is there any help you can give me? And then Winston said, the only help we can give you here is 
we send you on the front line because the guys will still come back to you and I can't control the situation so I was like I can't fight so D called me on the side and said what if we give, they give you an assignment and you be there so I said okay and I talked to Winston he said then you gotta give me some money so we gave him something some money and Winston gave me a piece of paper and said go to Sulu Town Sulu Town is a border town between Grand Basel and Nimba that's the last town and I went to Sulu Town when I got to Sulu Town they already had soldiers in Sulu Town that were on Moses Nasser and they say I was the commander in Sulu Town and the guy who was there Moses Nasser was in Kipuhu and some of the Suya was in Sultan, so he says Michael is going to be in Sultan, so we defy Kipuhu and Sultan. And so I sat down in Sultan. My basic assignment in Sultan was to monitor the movement of people from Bone County. And at that time, it was a peaceful time, peaceful in the sense that there were no fighting there. So I stayed in Sultan for some months. I only remember actually how long, but not for very long, maybe three, four months. And then the fighting intensified between the NPFL and the IPFL, I mean the LPC from the number three, number four area, and we're hearing the news and the launching sound. And when the fighting got very big and they could not control their, their, their post anymore, a lot of the generals retreated from the front line and came by way of Sultan while others used the main road to retreat in Bone County. And those who went by way, who went by way of Sultan, they entered Sultan, and the whole area was being controlled by those generals. And everybody decided to retreat, to go to um, Bone County. And I followed. At that time, I didn't have any power anymore because all the buses were already there. And when we entered Bone County, um, we went as far as I went. Uh, in one other place in Bone County. I don't remember that place anymore, and we were there. Then they took Reginald Balloon, whose name was known as Gronda from the post, and sending Johnson Lehman to take over. And Johnson Lehman took over, and they said, let everybody retreat, but let everybody go back to the post in Grand Basel County. And they requested for one one officers or soldiers to go. But I still had in control those boys that were with me from Sutan. They were about seven to eight. And they I sent two, three of them to join the group at number three. They joined the group and they went to Bonkan. They went by way of Nima to go through Zika Park to enter Grand Basel. So everybody was sending people and the fighters went to go into uh, Grand Basel County. So we heard a lot of news that they were killed and they didn't come back. And after a certain time, Chinese Japa say look we have to use the main road to go back to Grand Basel and then we all went back to Grand Basel and that was in 94 and when we got to Bone County we came back and the first group of people who entered Grand Basel County was the, they used to call them the Nima boys so they entered Grand Basel County and when we came we remained across the river in the town bordering Grand Basel and Bong and there we were until for some time, until they said to us that the area was clear. Because my position in Sultan, I would like to clarify, was a military police. That's an MP who was there to um, monitor the area. Um, and I still maintain that position while we were in uh, Grand Basel County and while we came back, I mean, while we left Neymar and came back to Grand Basel County. And when they said the place is clear, a military police don't go to war front. The, the, what you do is, when an officer goes to work and commit any act, they will send you to go and arrest that officer, bring him over and take him over to the authority, and they will investigate the officer. So uh, basically, that was it. Then when they said the area was clear. And civilians started moving 
we were moving along with the civilians, so we moved into this old town. And we were in this old town for some time. We had the church activities and everything going on. Until the father said, ahead of us were clearing, they were moving to uh, Pejuist town. And I stayed in Pejuist town for some time and left. I went on the main road to Asik Inua town. And there I left being an MP and decided to be a radio operator because I was actually interested in a radio operation because uh, it sharpened your skill uh, as a good talker and uh, as well as it make you to sit down and you don't have to bulk yourself with moving around. So I remain a radio operator. And after the NPFL took over Within April, from the LPC, we all went to Grand Bassa. And we got to Grand Bassa. I got involved in opening a studio, I mean, a restaurant called the um, Rendezvous. It was at a place called the White House that was owned by uh, Tom Woyu. And I saw Lizzie from one old man that was there in 1997, before the 1997 election that came to Monrovia. Now, as it relates to allegations that were leveled against me, during the period on a review, first of all, a Godward Town, let me just begin with Godward Town. Godward Town was an area operated by frontline fighter, especially within December. So until you are a frontline fighter and an active fighter, in December, then you cannot go to Godward Town. I don't remember going to Godward Town. I don't even remember getting involved in ordering people, be it in Godward Town or anywhere around, to rip, to kill as for being alleged, to burn houses. And it was so puzzling because I saw uh, Johnny Myers, not Johnny Myers, but uh, Johnny, P, Johnny P, who was the guardian of the boy, coming to say he, he knows that I did those things. Paul Flomo, who was the youth chairman, came and said that. But they also said they were not in Grand Basel County. And they were in Nima County during the time of 1994. So if they were in Nima County during the time of 1994, in December, then I also wondered then how did they come to the TRC to testify on issues that, or for issues that they, they did not see. I thought it was just hearing and testifying for what you know, but not what you hear because you have to testify from my own view what you know, not what people tell you. And I did not encounter no David Sewer during the time on a review. He came back to say he lied. And I understood you to say, or people say, or testimony say, I knew about it, and I was a part of it. And it's not possible that I would be a part of such thing. Because if he did say it, or like he said, I went, I ordered the rape of his sister, and 25 men raped his sister, that is far from possibility, honorable commissioners. 25 men raping a woman. And even if that was true, or if you say that our son of God went and coerced him to say it is true, that these things happen, but go and say it did not happen. She died and she was buried. I believe he did not say they ate the bodies. They could even show you the grave. You are heavily supported by the international community. They could show you the grave. You could dig up the grave. You do DNA. The parents are there. You ask them. So I wouldn't want us to waste our time on issues like uh, Sonica did it, but then he coerced the board to come and say that lie. You have a lot of ways of finding it out. As for Kemu Myers, I was in Bikeno when he said that I ordered or I went to beat him and took away his steel mail. And, 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 and I juke Benef on his muff, I mean, on his muff, and the Benef made him blind. 
I wouldn't want to talk further on that because I don't remember anything as such. I know this whole time because I lived in Weber. I don't know Maya Kemu, honestly. And if Obenef were juke, or if he were gashed as he clean, and he cannot see, then I wanna know how he left from his town and went and he walked, I saw him walking through and coming and nobody directed him a seat. And if I did such thing to him, he cannot remember me anymore to say, hey, this is Sonega. Or this is Michael Davis. But there's one thing I would like to tell you people today so that we all can understand. Being a part of the revolution is not anything that anybody can boast of. This is not anything that anybody can be proud of. If anybody does, I don't know, but that I can be proud of. I wrote a song and I sang a song and it says, Yesterday is gone. Use today wisely and make a better tomorrow. The past is what no man is in control of. And I want to use this opportunity. Nobody reads my mind, but God does. That from the bottom of my heart, I am honestly sorry for whatever role that I play during the revolution. If I did hurt anybody, if my being a part as a radio operator or the military police was harmful to anybody, I want to use the opportunity to say I'm truly, truly, truly sorry. And I mean it. The opportunity I really seek, but it was not given to me. I cooperated with the TRC from the genesis of the allegation. I went willingly and gave my testimony. But then I felt that it was unfair because the very time I gave my testimony, it was in the newspaper that Sonega is not willing to cooperate. And after I gave my testimony, it was also said that Sonega admitted that he committed atrocity in a new Democrat. But sources from the TRC, I don't know how true was that story. If a man comes here today and gave you a pathetic story and you begin to cry as members of the commissioner or members of the commissioner within the TRC, I would say, oh, these people have taken sides. But sometimes some stories are so pathetic. But we must be careful because it's not everything we read or we hear are true. I wouldn't know at what extent or for what reason the devil's ever come to give a story. But I didn't do any such thing. One thing, I don't intend to entrap myself, but I can tell you that it is possible that those things could have happened. But not with my involvement, not to my knowledge, and not that I know of it. I wouldn't want to say to you, yes, no, it didn't happen. But I don't know about it. And if anybody, like any other officer who were with me, went and did anything, then nobody did to come and still say, Son of God, these people are with you. They did such thing. So I don't know anything, and nobody did confront me. I was not fighting to go and kill. My orientation was not a warrior. I didn't go through war, war fighting orientation to go and kill people and, 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 and poor babies in murder as it was being said. But again, I say to you truly that I am sorry for whatever role that I play during the revolution. And I hope that if I did help any, hurt anybody during the time on a review that I will remember that I can seek the forgiveness and that we can all go forward during the healing process of this nation. I thank you very much. Um, thank you so much, Mr. Davis, for your testimony today before the TRC, starting with um, when you were in Lokinta and then any up in Grand Bassa County. We say thank you so much. Um, when you were testifying 
You say you were beaten and harassed and you have scars to show. Um, we take a five minutes break for now and then be back within five minutes time. But we would like for you to please show the scars to the um, hearing officer beside you so that we verify what you've said. Thank you so much. You're welcome.